Covenant Podcast exists to equip listeners with theological content from a 1689 Baptist perspective. We pray you find this resource edifying, faithful to Scripture, and Christ-exalting. Now, let's get started. Welcome to the Covenant Podcast. My name is Dewey Doble, and I will be hosting today's show on a subject that I think will be both fascinating and encouraging to our listeners. As we get the ball rolling with our episode for today, it's my pleasure to introduce a man who has been a dear friend to me for over five years and was a fellow church member during my time at Countryside Bible Church from 2017 to 2020. And that man is none other than Dr. Eric Weathers. And Dr. Weathers, it is my great privilege to have you on the Covenant Podcast to discuss the Masters Academy International. Welcome, brother. It's great to have you. Dewey, it's a delight to be with you guys. I can't wait to get this going, and uh, it's just fun to be with you. Most of our time has been spent at Countryside Bible Church there in South Lake, Texas, so it's it's fun to do a, a podcast with you. Absolutely. What a joy to have you on today. Um, You know, Dr. Weathers, since you're a first-time guest on the Covenant podcast, uh, what we typically do for our first-time guests is have them tell our listeners a little bit about their family, education, experience in vocational ministry, or any other subjects that uh, are near and dear to your heart that you'd like to share with our listeners just to help them get better acquainted with you. So we'd love to hear from you a little bit about yourself. Yeah. Hey, thanks. Thanks for the question. Um, (laughs) One of the things I like to talk about and encourage families, especially families with, uh, with teenage daughters, perhaps, is that a somebody's teenage daughter shared Christ with me for the first time when I was about seven years old. My family and I, we moved to Lancaster, California, out there in the Mojave Desert many years ago, and they didn't know anybody, my parents. And so they, uh, they asked a, uh, a neighbor if they could recommend a babysitter. And so a babysitter came over and shared the gospel to me with me and my brother and sister, older siblings, through the book of Revelation. And so she scared me to death into the kingdom, I like to say, even though I wasn't saved at that time. uh, It was certainly an eye opener for for just a young child to hear the the gospel for the first time. And so, you know, from the age of seven into my teenage years, I didn't know anything about a church. I, I tried to pick up an old family Bible. It was probably, I don't know, eight inches thick, maybe. And it was the King James Version. I made it through the first three chapters of that book. So little did I know then that it was the book of Genesis. So uh, King James was very difficult for me uh, out in the desert in California. So I never opened the Bible again until later on in, in my uh, teenage years. I, I was challenged by a friend. I, I was a competitive water skier for many years. And a friend of mine out on the lake asked me a question I'd never considered before. And it was, what if you know, what if you were to die tonight and you were to face Jesus and he were to say, well, why should I let you into heaven? I, I don't know. I was a proverbial deer in the headlights. You know, I didn't have any idea what he was talking about or even how to answer the question. So he pretty much described Ephesians 2, uh, you know, by grace we're saved through faith and that not of works. Uh, later on, I came to understand, you know, imputed righteousness. I had no righteousness of my own, nor does anybody else. So that righteousness of Christ was granted. I began to understand that later in my teenage years, um, probably about 18, 19 years old. And, uh, you know, that's when I met my wife, Debbie, and she invited me to this church uh, where they preached expository sermons. I had no idea what that was, but uh, it happened to be a guy named John MacArthur, where as a young man, I listened to him exposit God's word from the pulpit. And I was just in awe. I was, wow, you know, this would have been back and long before you were born, do we probably, I guess, maybe around 80, uh, 82, 83, sometime around there. And I decided, you know what, I want to go to Lagos Bible Institute where maybe I could figure out the difference between, you know, where's the Old Testament, where's the New Testament. I mean, I didn't know anything. And Lagos really settled me in my began to settle me in my faith, uh, you know, just books of the Bible, um, studying those and theology and apologetics and, you know, a dose of church history for a year. And at the end of that, I wanted more. And that's um, 1985 is when the master's college came into existence. Actually, it had been under LA Baptist for a number of years. I think they're celebrating their 95th year even this year. But anyway, I like to tell Pastor John when I see him, you know, Pastor, you and I started the college at the same time. You, uh, you were the president and I was a lowly student. So 
but it was just really something to be able to learn and to grow. Um, I, I got a bachelor's degree in Bible and youth ministry, and I don't know what Grace Community Church elders were thinking, but they asked me to come on as a part-time youth pastor, which was really amazing. Uh, the Lord really taught me a lot through godly people at the church, and it was just a delight. So um, the first year of the seminary, I was still a, a senior in college, and the second year of the master's seminary, I started attending there, did about a year, and then went off to uh, the corporate world. I, I wasn't ready for ministry. I was too young in the Lord, and I just didn't sense that that's where the Lord had me at that time. I needed some maturity, and so I prayed the Lord will put me in business, and from there, uh, worked for FedEx for a, a, an amazing career for 20 years, worked in Burbank, California for a number of years, and the company relocated my family back to Memphis, Tennessee, where where the company's uh, corporate headquarters is located. And I, I got to be involved in a number of things there, but it was really special to work out of the uh, the executive office where I worked uh, in the same building as our senior officers and was able to give direction advice to our leaders in the direction of the company. But there was still that emptiness, um, wanting to go back to seminary. And Debbie and I frequently call it our pipe dream uh, that that would never happen. We had you know two kids at the time that were in high school and then FedEx moved us off into Chicago, uh, worked in Chicago for a number of years. And then uh, finally, uh through a series of events uh was no longer uh we moved back out to los angeles so i could attend the uh the seminary and graciously dr Buznitz, who was the um dean of students at the time said that uh, he would allow me to keep my units that i'd earned way back in you know the 80s and was able to uh to go to seminary and graduate as an older man with an mdiv in 2012 and then served in two pastoral roles, one in Kentucky and one uh, near, um, if you're an Aggie fan, of course, uh, College Station, Texas for a few years. And, you know, I don't know, I, um, it, it was a great, great part of my life to shepherd God's people. But what I became to know as a greater passion was was uh, serving in world missions. And so Mark Tatlock, our president at the Master's Seminary, asked me if I would uh, travel with him around the world and do what we call vocation conferences. And that's those are conferences where we uh, help believers understand the importance of, of their work in the marketplace. And for me, that ended up turning into a doctoral um, preaching project and dissertation where I preached several sermons on um, really biblical principles for the marketplace. How do we understand our role as a believer in the marketplace? And so that turned into um, the beginnings of a great relationship with the Master's Academy International. And so I've been here now for five years uh, serving the Lord. My role takes me all over the country. Literally, I, I'm all over um, the U.S. preaching at conferences and in churches and presenting TMEI and meeting with donors. And uh, gratefully, my dear wife, Debbie, gets to come with me to all those. So anyway, that's ministry on on top of my own church, I mentioned countryside, do where we used to go. And so I still get to preach there frequently in, in Sunday school. But anybody wants to hear any of those, it's online. If you just go to countrysidebible.org, they're out there. So anyway, I, I hope that answers your question, Dewey. Absolutely. Um, you know, I I really have enjoyed getting to, to know Dr. Weathers over the past, I guess it's almost been six years now. It's hard to believe how quick time flies. And one of the one of the things that sticks out the most about Dr. Weathers, as he mentioned there, and you, you heard the passion in his voice, I'm sure, is his heart for world missions. And it's just incredible to see how God's providence orchestrated all the affairs in his life to ultimately prepare him for his work with the Master's Academy International, which about a year and a half, I actually had the privilege of allowing him to give one of those presentations at uh, the church where I'm currently located at. So really grateful for Dr. Weathers' work with TMAI. And as I mentioned during the introduction, that's what we're going to be focusing on for our conversation today, the Master's Academy International, otherwise known as TMAI. And Dr. Weathers, just um, for those of our listeners who may not have much knowledge about TMAI, um, could you provide them with maybe a flyover of how TMAI was founded and then uh, more broadly what TMAI does as a ministry? 
Sure. Thank you for that question. That's a, a great question. So um, TMAI was first founded uh, under a different name. Um, but the idea was, is that when the Berlin Wall came down, there were several pastors um, in the former um, Soviet Union, that former Soviet bloc, who uh, uh, who were out of prison, uh, finally. And so they contacted John MacArthur and asked him to come out and give them pastoral instruction. How do they preach? You know, how do they study the Bible? How do they how do they shepherd their people? And so Pastor John made several trips back and forth to Ukraine and uh, some of the former uh, Soviet uh, uh, states. Uh, and so he would train these pastors and, and he would land and, and off the plane, he'd teach for nine, 10 hours. Uh, that's Pastor John. Uh, that's just what he does. And so after several trips back and forth, they wanted him to stay. And he's like, guys, I you know, I have my own church to shepherd. I can't keep coming back and forth. But he says, just dawned on me. I'm a president of a seminary, the master's seminary. So he said, how about if I, um, if I raise the attention to some of our students, current students, and even graduates and see if, and see if it's something they want to do to take that on. And so delightfully, a couple of the guys that I went to school with, I mentioned the Lagos Bible Institute a moment ago, and uh, uh, those guys are still in Ukraine. I won't mention their names for security reasons at this point, but they are still there. Uh, they've had 900 graduates from that school. We can talk more about Ukraine in a minute. But so that was the very beginning. And we've added since then many other schools. We've got Albania and Argentina. We just added uh, Argentina a month and a half ago. Croatia, Czech Republic. We've got the European Bible Training Center, which is Germany, Switzerland, Austria, of course, Honduras, covering uh, you know Central America. We're in India, Italy. Uh, you asked me the the beginnings of it, so this is where it's going. It, from the beginning, it continued to expand. We added Japan a couple of years ago. We've got Malawi there in Africa and Mexico, Middle East. I won't say where we are in the Middle East for obvious reasons, but. Uh, we're in South Africa, Spain, the Philippines. Uh, I mentioned Ukraine, of course, we're there. And uh, in terms of Russia, we do our Russian training in the United States and uh, the state of Washington. We do all of our Russian training there, uh, as well as some in Russia. But um, so anyway, that's the expansion uh, going back all the way to, to the early 90s, 91, 92. And we continue to grow. Uh, in a moment, I'll maybe even tell you some about the schools, the nations that we're entering here in the next five years or so. But uh, in terms of um, in terms of the growth, we've, we've got about 7,200 graduates around the world where uh, we've got graduates in over 80 nations. We're actually training in 80 nations. So we would have graduates that could go even farther than just their own nation doing that kind of, um, you know, training uh, uh, men to preach God's word. And the whole idea is that we are, we're training men to equip their own congregations in their own languages so that they do what we're called to do in our churches in the U S and that's to equip the saints to do the work of the ministry, but they need shepherds to taint train them. And so that's our purpose. Uh, you know, our, our mission statement is pretty simple. Uh, TMAI is committed to fulfilling the great commission by training church leaders to be uh, approved pastor teachers, able to equip churches to make biblically sound disciples. And so that is consistent across all our 18 brick and mortar schools and within the 80 countries in which we, we serve God's people. So anyway, that's the quick flyover, I hope. Amen. Well, Dr. Weathers, you touched on, um, really what I want to go now with this next question about uh, wanting to raise up gifted and, and qualified leaders to equip the saints for ministry. And uh, I know one of the main emphases with TMAI is doing that, uh, particularly with indigenous people, uh, people who are there, who speak that language, who, who do life with people in those parts of the world where you're planning TMAI training centers. Uh, would you be willing to share a little bit about the process that is utilized by TMAI, not to only identify the individuals who would be, um, I guess you could say, um, qualified to be taught. Like, how, So what does it look like to identify men who would be qualified to go through a TMAI program? Um, and then from there, what does it look like for their process of actually being trained through a TMAI location and then sent out through that location? 
Sure. Well, let's let's even do it. Let me take your question and put it one more step before it. How does how does a how does a, a, a training center qualify to even be a TMEI training center? Because there's there's plenty of training centers out there that are trying to become one of our associated schools. So, in essence, there's a lot to it. But the big ones are, you know, we want two master seminary graduates on the ground. That doesn't mean that you know we can't have other professors from other uh, uh, um, seminaries. It's just that there's a requirement to have two on the ground. Uh, there's a requirement to have um, agreement with our doctrinal statement, which can be found on our website at tmei.org, which uh, is the same as uh, the Master Seminary. So, so we want that right up front. We want, um, you know, unity right at the gate. So um, each training center, as I said, has to have two of those graduates. Now, in terms of the students themselves, how do they how do they get in? And that's going to vary per training center, but um, I'll I'll speak consistent across those uh, schools, but the idea is that they're going to be students who are recommended by current pastors. Those pastors are going to be uh, men who probably, you know, are graduates, they're alumni, or, you know, they're trusted pastors in their country who can vouch for them. And the reason that's important, um, especially in Asia and in Africa, is that uh, it's just a culture of, of um, I don't know, uh, a degree mill. So a lot of, a lot of people will get degrees in several different topics and we don't, we don't want to give a, you know, a, um, a, uh, a certificate degree or a bachelor's degree or a master's or a doctorate to anybody that's just going to go off and go to some different school. We want, we want somebody who on the other end is going to be, um, able and is equipped to make disciples. And so we're trying to catch that on the front end in our vetting system. So each school is a little different, but that's, uh, kind of consistent in the approach that we're we're taking. Um, the types of classes that we have are, you know, it's um, uh, maybe I should say degrees, and then we'll talk about classes. But classes can be anywhere from a certificate program. We find those important in countries that don't have, you know, an advanced uh, high school level kind of education or even university level. But nonetheless, we need to reach them. We need to teach them how to study their own Bible in their own language so that they can teach others. And so, you know, we have a certificate program. And from that certificate program, they can then, you know, make a decision. Do I want to go after a bachelor's degree, which will be, you know, more robust. And it's uh, uh, going to have a lot more requirements, uh, require a lot more study skills. And so many will pursue that. And so what they're getting in terms of a bachelor's degree, they're getting, you know, Old Testament, New Testament, they're getting theology and apologetics. They're getting, uh, of course, um, hermeneutics, uh, how to study the Bible of science and the art of biblical interpretation. So those classes are going to get, but once they get on into an MDiv level, it's, it, again, it's going to vary per country, uh, but we're going to give them their original languages. So they're going to study Greek and Hebrew uh, that's important because we have guys in Africa that uh, are experts in Greek and Hebrew and can translate uh, the original languages into their village languages, uh, you know, uh, translate a Bible into a language that, you know, you and I have probably never heard of. Those guys are, you know, preaching and teaching in those languages. So that's important from the MDiv standpoint. And then many of our uh, professors who have an MDiv uh, are given scholarships to come to the United States to get, uh, you know, a THM or a D-min, a doctor of ministry and expository preaching, or even a PhD in Old New Testament theology, wh whatever field they want to go into. But the requirement from that point would be to go back to their sending country. We don't want them staying in the U.S., and so we uh, we make sure they go back home and shepherd their their churches so you know upon graduating uh men serve in their churches from which they came uh some uh those churches find that expository preaching is not what they're used to uh, a real light sort of preaching and so for those guys um some of them won't be welcome back to their churches and so they're going to plant other churches uh where they can really disciple people using the word of god and not just you know popular pop culture, um, uh, I don't know, silly ideas, whatever, ha what have you. So that's, uh, hopefully answers that question. Absolutely. And a lot of encouraging testimonies that you've already shared and answering the questions that I've 
presented to you thus far in the conversation, but just from a personal standpoint, from what you have heard or experienced firsthand, what would you say are some of the most encouraging testimonies that you have come into contact with during your time serving with TMAI? Well, let me give you a couple of stories, um, and then I'll give you some statistics that I think you might find, your listeners might find very encouraging. But um, I was uh, making a trip to South Africa from my home in Texas, and I uh, contacted our leadership team in South Africa, and I said, guys, um, you know, we're having some meetings. I want to make sure on a Sunday that I go to a church from one of our graduates at Christ Seminary in Paul Kwani excuse me, I'll say that more clearly, Palakwani, South Africa, which is the northern part of uh, uh, South Africa. And, you know, I wanted to go to a church with one of our graduates who was preaching. And so they set me up a uh, church uh, with one of our graduates, a guy named Sammy Labalo. He, um, he's, he is a precious uh, friend now, but we, he and I had not met before I finally arrived. So showed up one Sunday morning and, and the guys that, you know, invited me to come to his church forgot to tell Sammy that I was going to be there. I was the only guy that looked like, um, uh, you know, a guy that looks like me. So I sat in the back of the church and as they were singing hymns, it was amazing. I understood the hymns because you can, you know, you can pick up on the music and the rhyme, even though I don't know the language, but what was encouraging is they, they sang every hymn three times. So they, they started in English and they didn't have, you know, somebody like we would have on a guitar or piano leading music. It would be somebody that that just had an amazing voice or maybe even just a, a slight hand drum, bongo drum or something, just to get the rhythm. And this beautiful sound would come out of this individual's mouth and the entire congregation would join in, in, in singing the hymn. And then it blew me away when all of a sudden they, they switched from English and began to sing in Zulu. And then they'd sing that song again in Sutu. And then I learned that Sammy could not only preach in English, but those languages as well. Those are the tongues of his land, the languages of his land. And so he's very comfortable with that. So I knew I was at home when Sammy took the pulpit, just like any well-trained expository preacher would, especially at the Master Seminary, for example, he stood up and he said, okay, let's turn to uh, 1 Thessalonians chapter 1. We left off in verses 9 and 10. Let's just pick it up there. And he nailed the text. Uh, you could tell that this Sammy was just a dear brother in the Lord and can preach. And what, what was fascinating about Sammy is that he, uh, his church is located, and your older listeners would be familiar with this, uh, the Soweto Township of Johannesburg. And why this is important, why I mention it, and, and, and especially with Sammy, is that um, many of us aren't getting the history that we should be getting. But so turning your history books and look up apartheid, most of your listeners would be familiar with that word. But apartheid meant something entirely different to Sammy's community. You see, that community was uh, now it's two and a half million people. It's a slum. And back in the apartheid days, uh, um, the only way a black person could get out of their community, Soweto, was to have a letter from a white person saying that they would be working for that white person. And then they'd have to come back home and they couldn't get out without that letter. So fast forward through, you know, changes in politics and, and governments and all that. Sammy goes to school. Uh, I asked him why he chose Christ Seminary. And he, he said that he met a guy named Joseph McCalla, who is one of our professors there. And Joseph challenged him with the word of God. He, you know, Sammy would make observations from a particular biblical text that were just outright wrong. But Joseph was patient with him and walked him through passages. And he's like, I want to do that. How do I do that? So he went to Christ Seminary, uh, as I said, and he graduated. He came back and he tells the story about how before when he preached, he would just say whatever came to his mind. There was no preparation. It was just whatever at the spur of the moment came into his mind. And he would try to do things like, um, uh, you know, Kenneth Copeland or other uh, popular, I don't know, false teachers, I guess. Uh, and, and But Christ Seminary taught him how to study God's word. And now he is uh, moving on from, 
in his shepherding role, he's got 20 students of his own. He's taken them all through biblical doctrine, that 900 page book of uh, serious biblical doctrine. So Sammy has grown in the Lord and he is just a, a treasure uh, from the Lord. So anyway, that's Sammy Labalo. Be praying for him in South Africa. There's another guy, um, Daniel, who's from Paraguay, uh, another story on the uh, another um, continent. So I love this story about Daniel. Uh, he is a he studies with TMEI's newest training center there in Buenos Aires, Argentina. We just opened Argentina, I'm guessing about six weeks ago. It took a few years for them to become one of our qualified schools, but they're up and running. Well, so Daniel wakes up every morning at three o'clock. And he does that because he wants two hours in the word of God. By five o'clock, he's out milking the cows and doing his farm chores where he lives. And when he completes his morning chores, he uh, jumps in his truck and heads off into the city where he is a construction worker. Then after several hours of working in construction, he returns home to his farm, does some more chores. And then in the evening, he is shepherding his flock. He's meeting with believers in his church, his teaching Bible studies, encouraging marriages, even his own, of course, with his own wife. Um, you see centuries of Roman Catholicism throughout South America and really, you know, devastating prosperity gospel teachers uh, have made uh, faithful mentors and sound doctrine sparse in, in uh, South America, really impossible to find. And so God has given Daniel. Um, a love for the church. It's shown in his studies. He, he studies hard because he wants to equip the people in his own church to do the work of the ministry. Again, back to Ephesians 4. And if that means for him waking up early in the morning, well, that's worth it. You know, it's, it's entirely worth it. He's young enough that he can keep going. And, and when the leadership team from our um, Argentine uh, Academy went up, to, um, went up to his area in Paraguay, by the way, the school is the Expositors Institute in Argentina. We call it IDEAR. It's I-D-E-A-R for short. But anyway, when the leadership showed up at his house uh, and visited in his home uh, to provide hands-on training, they were so encouraged to see and to hear his heart for people that it extends far beyond his, his own local church. He he has a mindset of, uh, of the Great Commission, and he instills that Great Commission on the minds of, of even his own church. And so his congregation are, are Great Commission-minded as well and reaches further into Paraguay, even into uh, some of the remote jungles where the languages are, are unknown to most of the world's populations. But, but they're learning those languages. They know those languages. I shouldn't say they're learning them. They know them. So Daniel and, um, and other IDEAR students are preaching uh, to these tribes in their native languages. Dewey, you and I could never do that. We could never just show up in Paraguay and, you know, with a baseball cap on and uh, a Bible in hand and say, let me tell you about Jesus. You know, we wouldn't get very far. They would have no idea what we're talking about. And so it's important that we train indigenous people uh, in, uh, in their own languages. Uh, these guys have a desire to translate what they're learning at idea into those languages so that they can reach the people with the gospel again with that same theme so that those tribesmen can equip the saints to do the work of the ministry right there in their own uh, little context. Well, uh, you know, we need to start somewhere. So we're building with that kind of a training in mind. So, yeah, the idea is for the, their own men to one day uh, be trained expository preachers in their own churches. Well, for Daniel, uh, it's clear that God put it on his heart, and, uh, and Team EI is grateful for the opportunity to come alongside IDEAR there in Argentina, extending right there into uh, Paraguay, a neighboring country, uh, to serve more students like Daniel, both in Argentina and, um, and not only across the nation, but across the region, across all of South America. That's the idea as we continue to expand. So we're grateful to those who are uh, ardent supporters of this ministry and help us to reach into uh, uh, the lives like Daniel so that uh, his church, his whole congregation can go into neighboring villages and countries. So anyway, that's that. I, I mentioned that I would like to mention a few statistics, of course. Um, 73% and this is shocking, 73% of the 
of our um, professors are indigenous. The faculty is indigenous. That means we're training up uh, men in their own countries to lead their own schools. And so uh, in many countries around the world, we don't have American leadership. It is indigenous leadership. And so that's our goal. That's why uh, we're so uh, strong-minded about training our faculty um, in advanced degrees. We, we um, amongst our people, we speak 38 languages amongst our student body around the world. Uh, we've got 138 current books in translation, uh, in progress, including um, the Albanian Bible. The Albanian Bible was translated from Italian into Albanian a number of years ago. Well, now we have a guy uh, in Albania who's one of our graduates. Uh, he's Albanian, and he's translating for the first time, as I understand it, the Albanian Bible uh, from Greek and Hebrew into the English language he and his team. So, as I mentioned, we're, we're translating a lot. Statistically speaking, we're translating into Italian, into Burmese and Armenian, Russian. We've got Arabic and uh, Finnish, Japanese. I mentioned Zulu earlier. We're doing Zulu, for goodness sakes. Of course, Ukrainian, since we've been there for so many years. Bahasa, that's Indonesian. German, Chinese, English uh, for India and the Philippines. We've got some major projects that we've um, up and coming. Zulu and Hebrew translations of the MacArthur Study Bible. Um, this is cool. The MacArthur Study Bible is being translated into modern Hebrew uh, for uh, people in uh, in Israel and around the world that speak that language. So we're doing Armenian, uh, Armenian, Armenian, Armenian translation of essential Christian doctrine. Uh, of course, Arabic, Polish, Russian um, translations into biblical doctrines as well. Um, there's a, a whole host of other books that we're, um, we're working on, uh, books that we've completed in 2021. So anyway, that's uh, an idea of some of the things we're working on right now. Well, you know, I hear reports like that, and I, I just think of just the passion that the Lord gives to men who are called and equipped for ministry. And I think of what Paul writes in 1 Corinthians 9, 16, when he says that, He's under compulsion to preach the gospel, and woe is me if I do not preach the gospel. And only a man who is called and, and, and equipped for ministry will make the kind of sacrifices that you have just shared with our listeners that is happening time after time after time overseas. So uh, for, uh, for those who are listening today, I just want to encourage you, as Dr. Weathers mentioned previously, pray for those men that TMEI has um, has raised up and is continuing to raise up in uh, all different parts of the world, um, even right now, because uh, they have great challenges and um, and that they are they are constantly, uh, I'm sure, overwhelmed with the burden that it is to shepherd their family well, their church well, and then just to support themselves as well. On top of all of that, so let's be in prayer for them as they continue to embark upon the task that God has called them to, and that He will continue to strengthen them by His Spirit to enable them to press on in a way that's honoring to him. So Dr. Weathers, I do thank you for those testimonies. Um, I, I've been greatly encouraged just by hearing them today. Um, but I also mentioned uh, even there in that, in that little transitory statement that um, I can only imagine the challenges that come with being an indigenous missionary or an indigenous pastor who is trying to take the Bible from the original languages translate them into their language, teach the word to the people that God's entrusted under their care, support their families, um, stay alive in some cases when it comes to persecution that's being yeah. faced overseas. Would you be willing to share? I'm sure there's a lot more things that could be said regarding the difficult challenges faced by TMAI staff and students, but would you be willing to share um, from, from your perspective, uh, being involved with TMAI for so long, what are some of the most difficult or more common challenges that are faced by those associated with TMAI? Yeah, a number of things come to mind. Um, you know, one of the one of the uh, somewhat common, although not too common, but important challenges that we face is in in some continents, um, countries where we have students, where we've taught them how to divide, right, rightly divide the word of truth. We teach them the original languages. We 
given their theology and their doctrine. But we, beyond that, we have to keep encouraging them to stay faithful to the text, to, to preach authorial intent, to keep up their hermeneutical studies, and uh, to, to keep up their sound biblical approach to mining the text, to know what it meant to the original audience so that they can describe in their own languages what it means to their people. Because what it meant in, you know, Jerusalem or the surrounding area in the New Testament 2,000 years ago it was what it means in, you know, what it, what it means in Soweto and Johannesburg, South Africa, or anywhere else around the world. So it's a challenge to keep them focused on that and to keep shepherding them and mentoring them through that process. So there have been um, a small number of guys who would return, and the pressure is so significant to be that health, wealth, and prosperity preacher that brings the throngs through the door. Um, the, the, the big popular church in, in you know, our country and any other country for that matter doesn't necessarily mean they're doing things right. They're just getting a crowd. And so we're, we're, we're trying to just um, help them to understand that they're reaching people with the gospel and the gospel is not their gospel. It, it is the biblical gospel. Other things that, that are a challenge for us are uh, obviously um, closed access countries, persecuting countries. It doesn't stop us. We, um, as an organization, uh, you know, we our, our students, they graduate, and from there, they reach the nations for Christ. They reach the ethnicities around them, whether it's in their own uh, countries that are former Soviet bloc countries, or even, you know, we just call it communist countries, for example, or uh, or other religion kind of countries, uh, they are reaching across borders, across borders, and they are training people uh, how to shepherd their house churches. Uh, house church, because you, in a lot of these countries, you don't have a big building that says, here we are, we're Christians, come get us. You know, they're, they're in their home churches. And so that training continues. And sometimes we don't get to leave them or, or our graduates don't get to leave them with a Bible or with notes to take home and study. Uh, no, these guys are having to memorize their coursework. They're having to memorize how to, you know, do the things that they do so they can teach. And so uh, we have um, our graduates have ways of doing that uh, over borders that um, that you and I could could never uh, go into those countries uh, and live for very long anyway. So uh, there's other challenges. Uh, of course, COVID, you know, last couple of years has been a challenge. Um, it's not as difficult as our leadership team planned for it to be, quite frankly. Uh, you know, we had some, we have some very serious minded IT kind of donors that said, you know, we're not going to let this happen. We're going to, we're going to help you uh, set up Zoom, you know, styled live training in your classes. And so, Within 24 hours, we had all of our schools, except for one, uh, doing live training. They didn't miss a beat. They kept going. Uh, the only country where we struggled with was Malawi. Uh, Malawi is difficult because um, uh, they didn't have the uh, internet access. Uh, they didn't have the phones. They're too expensive. So we, uh, we bought phones for our students, and then we bought airtime, which is very expensive. So their training continued. So, yeah, COVID was difficult. Um, uh, the Lord took some of our professors home to be with him uh, from that disease, as well as some of our students. But yet he, uh, through that, that catastrophe, global catastrophe, we've seen um, our, our student population grow significantly because people want to know the Lord and they want to teach others. Um, recently with Ukraine, uh, I mentioned earlier that Ukraine was our first school. We've got 900 graduates there who uh, continue to preach. Many of them were conscripted into the army to protect their families, to protect their countries. And they continue to uh, to be um, a voice for the gospel out there, even as they serve in a military kind of a setting. Pray for them. Many of them, we haven't heard from them. We, uh, we know that the Lord is in control and takes care of them. So pray for Ukraine. Um, we have a school in Berlin, Germany, that um, European Bible Training Center. And a few times a week, they'll take several tons of materials to Ukraine and, and some of the refugees in the outlying countries. So it'll be food and medical needs, medicine, pharmaceuticals. 
We're also handing out uh, multiple thousands of tracts. We've got a, a project now underway where we're going to hand out about 100,000 Ukrainian Bibles. So we're, we're taking those in uh, to the people. So, yeah, there's, uh, there's setbacks, but like anything else, the Lord is always, without question, victorious, even in the most difficult circumstances that we face, because um, ultimately he's in control and nothing is going to stop the growth of his church. Nothing. Amen. We know, Dr. Weathers, when you were visiting the church where I was employed at here in Southeast Texas and given a um, presentation of TMAI, you mentioned that for some Christians, they are called uniquely to go uh, into ministry, whether it be in missions or whether it be um, domestically as well. But there's also other people who are called to serve as a Gaius and, and thinking of um, Third John, where they are called to hold the rope, as it were, to provide financial support to those who um, would go overseas to to uh, advance the gospel, to train up the next generation of pastors and teachers in the local church. So for, for those who may be here listening to this podcast, and, and, and they know they're not called um, to global missions, but they certainly know that they have a biblical responsibility to support the advancement of the Great Commission mandate through uh, financial contribution and through uh, supporting like-minded missionary organizations such as TMAI, what steps can they take to extend their support to this ministry? And from a local church standpoint, how can local churches begin the process of partnering with TMAI in their efforts to advance the gospel uh, to all nations, as well as to raise up local church leaders um, and, and the next generation of Christian uh, seminary professors and teachers as well that are coming through the TMAI programs? Yeah, you know, Dewey, you mentioned uh, one of my favorite personalities in, uh, in, in all of scripture, and so few people know about him. In fact, when I was doing my doctoral studies, I somehow landed on the book of Third John, and I'm like, where on earth has this book been all my life? You know, as I read it, I, I thought to myself, oh, Lord, what would it have been like for me to have read this as a, as a corporate businessman at FedEx all those years ago? How would my life be different in terms of my understanding of missions, you see Gaius wasn't, there's no indication that Gaius was a pastor, no indication that he was a missionary. On the contrary, he was probably a businessman. He was probably, I don't know, a, a farmer, maybe um, maybe somebody in his own realm of success somehow in the marketplace. He was complimented by the Apostle John for the manner in which he takes care of missionaries. Um, and I love this in the text. It says, uh, John writes to guys, he says, you send these guys off in a manner worthy of God. Uh, he didn't give the missionaries their, you know, their, their kids to their kids, uh, use clothes. Uh, he didn't give them things that, that they didn't, he, he gave them things in a manner worthy of God. And it could have been financial support. Uh, certainly it was food. It was water. It was sustenance. It was, uh, you know, clean them up and send them on. And so he had this reputation and, and John prays that he would be prosperous, prosperous because he's using his, uh, the Lord's, not his, the Lord's resources to take care of those who are reaching the ethnicities of that world then for Christ, which by extension uh, helps us to understand even in the marketplace, God uses his people to reach the ethnicities, the nations of the world through supporting and praying for missionaries. So you asked how they can help us. Well, you know, in terms of, um, of TMAI, uh, please visit us at tmai.org. That's short for the Master's Academy International. So that's tmai.org. Uh, and while you're there, declaring his glory among the nations, it's a daily devotional that we have. It's free of charge. We give them away, uh, for goodness sakes. And so for every day, there's a different author on each individual page that's commenting on a particular passage of scripture to encourage our readers. And what's fascinating is these authors are from literally all over the world. There are 200 select writers from our, I don't know, 7,200 graduates that wrote these. And you can kind of get a, a consistency in how they write, how, how they're trained, and how they challenge God's people. So go to tmei.org and get that, uh, get your hands on that. Another way that, um, that you can 
be a part of our ministry uh, in the very short term is on July 17th, all the way through July 24th. And you can see this at TMA.org. Join us for what we call Together We Pray. Uh, it's a week of global intercessions for shepherds and saints is what we call it. So that's where you, uh, you who are listening, if you want to submit a prayer request on that website, uh, we are distributing prayer requests to our oh, current about 22, 2300 students and, and faculty who will personally pray for you. And then we're going to ask you to pray for them. So we're going to make available specific prayer requests from, um, from 80 countries all over the world where you can pray for those who are equipping or being equipped to serve Christ well. So again, that's July 17th through the 24th. Um, and make sure you're, you're a part of that. Now, in terms of, um, of the local church, the local church, we have uh, two precious men who are on staff at TMAI. They're actually full-time TMS, Master Seminary students, and they're part-time with us. And we call them ambassadors. And so they work uh, very closely with churches that want to work with us. And they'll build a customized uh, approach to helping TMAI reach the nation's um, and, and so you can go to tmei.org and if you look under the connect tab, that's C O N N E C T, the connect tab on our website, uh, look up, uh, the ambassadors are, I think it has to do something with, uh, connecting churches or something like that on the website, but you'll, you'll find it. Um, yeah, so that's, uh, local churches. And of course, um, uh, as Dewey mentioned, I, I preached at his church. Uh, invite me to come and preach at your church, um, uh, present TMA at your church. So typically uh, during a major main service, I'll preach a particular passage of scripture, an expository sermon. It may or may not have anything to do with, with missions, but uh, then, you know, during um, Sunday school or an evening service, I'll do a full-blown presentation on, on TMAI. Um, uh, so anyway, you can you can reach me at, uh, at info at tmai.org. That's info at tmai.org. That's an email address, and I'll uh, get your message from there. So those are for the churches, uh, how to connect with us, Dewey. Very good. Well, we've been talking with Dr. Eric Weathers about the Master's Academy International and his work with this organization as the Senior Vice President of Strategic Partnerships. Dr. Weathers, before we draw today's episode to a conclusion, do you have any final words of encouragement or advice to those who desire to get involved with the common task of TMAI, namely to raise up ind indigenous church leaders around the world? Wow, what a, what a wonderful question. Thanks for that. Um, thank you, and thank you to your listeners. Uh, we need your help, quite frankly. We need your help. As you can imagine, training up, you know, current population student load of 2200 people uh, is quite an undertaking so we've we've identified what we like to call the three eyes that's the letter i the three eyes and that's to intercede we need we need your prayers which is why we're excited about this week in july 17th through 24th for together we pray we need your prayers so intercede for us and you'll get specific ways on how to do that you can also go to tmi.org and and we release um very brief updates from different places around the world. It's been primarily um, Ukraine um, and uh, and Berlin, Germany and Argentina lately, but we, we feature all of our schools there. So you, you can get up to date on, on, on our schools around the world. So that's the first one, intercede, and then introduce us to great commission-minded people. Uh, Pastor John MacArthur was in a staff meeting a couple of years ago, and he made a statement, I'm, I'm never going to forget it. I just won't. And he looked at us and he said, TMEI is the world's best kept secret in world missions. And immediately I said, yes, Pastor John, but we're here to change that. And so we're trying to figure out how to do that. So uh, a lot of that has to do with uh, like the prayer event that we're talking about, um, you know, initiatives like the Declaring His Glory Among the Nations. You can order that free book. Uh, it's me uh, going out throughout the country and the world, presenting TMEI, preaching and talking about what we do. So so first, intercede, then introduce, and then, of course, invest. Um, this is how you can help us. Invest uh, in this ministry. We're, we're trying to reach the world's ethnicities with the gospel of Christ. And the way in which we do that is through trained biblical expositors so that there is a, 
a church prayerfully in every town, in every village, in every hamlet, in every major city of the world that has an expositor. That's a long range goal, but you know what? We're we're heading towards that. But we need we need people who who want to help us. Um, that could be you know widow's might, and it could be somebody who uh, who sees their business as a way to um, undergird the expenses of those around the world who are in the trenches. So anyway, uh, that's a lot of ways you can, you can help us, but we've identified it with those three eyes, intercede, introduce, and invest. Thank you. Yes, sir. Well, it's been a delight to talk with my dear friend, Dr. Eric Weathers about all that the Lord is doing through the Masters Academy International. So to our listeners, I pray that this conversation has been edifying and encouraging to you. And on behalf of the Covenant Podcast, we wish you grace and peace. God bless. For additional content, check out our blog ministry at covenantconfessions.com. Also, keep up with our social media accounts on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. Next, head on over to iTunes and leave us a review. Lastly, thank you for listening to the Covenant Podcast. Grace and peace to you.